This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and glittering symbol of excess. In this court, we have had many, many, many variations of the cautionary show business melodrama, and our next offender, Vox Lux, is adding yet another flavor into the mix. The ambition of writer-director Brady Corbett was to expand the typical narrative of this genre to encompass sensationalism in the broader culture of- Okay, come on. I know I can figure this out. I have the Fool followed by the Ace of Wands and the Ace of Swords, then Judgment and the Devil. (sighs) I'll tell you this, they're not usually so on the nose. Hey, la femme fictionale. Ça va? You seem unusually calm for being where you are. <laughs> I have lived in Texas in July with no AC. This is fine. Is that what I think it is on your docket? You know it? <laughs> with my hyperfixation? I not only saw this in theaters, I read all the pre-release press coverage. Did you know that the director was partially inspired by news alerts on his phone putting things like mass murders next to celebrity haircuts? That juxtaposition of the horrific with the frivolous and their interconnectivity in modern culture was the driving force of Corbet's creative process. It was also part of the reason he got Sia to be the songwriter. He specifically wanted someone who was good at writing generic pop. Well, you know your stuff. I suppose a co-counsel wouldn't hurt on this one. Let's examine the case of Vox Lux. We begin with home movie footage and narration by Willem Dafoe introducing our main character, Celeste, as an average child of the 90s and foreshadowing her eventual not-normal future, which transitions into a seemingly mundane setup of students returning to high school in January 2000. Well... Technically, the title card says it's 1999, but the narration suggests it's 2000, so we're already off to stellar phantom levels of incompetent post-production. Not so fun fact. When this movie was making the rounds on the festival circuit and at promotional screenings, they had to provide a content warning for the big opening set piece, which is a mass shooting at Celeste's high school committed by one of her classmates, Colin Active. His name is... Oui. And he's a... Vraiment ça. Ah, ah, ah. The school shooting scene is sin number one. It's clearly written to evoke the 1998 Columbine High School shooting in Aurora, Colorado, and it ends up perpetuating two of the most persistent and annoying myths about that tragedy. The first is Cullen himself. He's a black-clad, androgynous kid with goth makeup, echoing the early image of the Columbine shooters as tragic misfits who were bullied and traumatized into inflicting a horrific vengeance on their tormentors. Future evidence revealed that this was not the case. The shooting was nothing less than an act of planned terrorism, inspired by white supremacy horrors like the Third Reich and the Oklahoma City bombing. The second is Celeste offering to pray with Cullen, only to be shot in response. This is likely inspired by the publicity surrounding the death of Cassie Bernal. After the Columbine massacre, the story circulated that one of the shooters had asked Bernal if she believed in God, killing her after she replied in the affirmative. It is an inspiring tale of faith in the darkest of circumstances and courageous martyrdom. And if you believe a word of it, I have a meditation retreat in the Fifth Circle to sell you. The popular account of Bernal's death is at best dubious, but that hasn't stopped her parents from exploiting her theoretical martyrdom for personal and political purposes. So, are you gonna get in trouble if we skip ahead? I just, I don't feel like snarking something so atrocious and yet so normalized. Look, I may be a demon, but I do have some standards. Continue. Celeste is found alive but badly wounded in the aftermath, and brought to a hospital over minimalist credits that lead into our Act 1 title card, Genesis. Put a pin in that for later. As Celeste works on recovery, we're introduced to her sister Eleanor, who was homesick during the shooting. Both girls are clearly dealing with different levels of survivor's guilt, and eventually collaborate on a tribute song to be performed at their classmate's memorial. Hey, turn. No one to show me the way. 
the song, Wrapped Up, is all right for what it is. It's the kind of rough-around-the-edges song and performance that makes sense for this character in this moment, but unfortunately, the movie refuses to let us properly appreciate it, as the narration jumps back in, expositing on how the song becomes a hit over the next year, and then the movie goes into very dramatic shots of New York City landmarks, briefly interrupted by Celeste and Ellie doing an oddly-placed badass slow-mo walk with their new manager, played by Jude Law in scummy mode. We see Celeste in a recording session for a song with so many I, 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 I's that I keep expecting a continental principality to break through the ceiling, followed by a meeting with Josie, a publicist played by Jennifer Ely. And I guess their parents are just fine with entrusting their daughters to strangers in a business known to be predatory. As the movie shifts from this meeting to Celeste's dance training... I'm going to call sin number two on the awkwardness of the construction, both from a structural and technical standpoint. In a more stylized genre like a docudrama, these events could have given shape to the story and a sense of forward momentum. In their current form, it feels more like Brady Corbet decided the best way to critique the rise to stardom portion of movies like these was to present them in as dull and unengaging a format as possible. The technical side of things further accentuates the genre misplacement, since the filming style is more in keeping with a documentary-slash-found-footage movie, but it ends up with a lot of scenes that are hard to watch because we can't see the characters, or they have their backs to us, or everything is wobbling like the Steadicam operator is on his fifth martini of the day. This is especially detrimental given that the movie was subtitled A 21st Century Portrait, and yet Corbett seems unwilling to let us see the subject of said portrait. The girls bond in a moment that might have been cute if it weren't for the fact that they're both teenagers planning on going clubbing, and with Celeste already on painkillers for her spine, that would seem to be a recipe for the Drew Barrymore experience. The manager then interrupts to let them know that two of the songs have tested positive, and he's taking them to Stockholm to work with a producer on a full album. Somewhere out there in the multiverse is a version of this movie where Max Martin did the songs instead of Sia. And I'd like to be there, please. The Defoe narration returns to info dump about Stockholm's music scene and the girls' trip there over sped-up footage that's begging for some Benny Hill, and Ellie introduces Celeste to the second part of Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, which gets the girls chewed out by the manager on the way home, as if he bears no responsibility for it as their guardian, and then decides to take them to Los Angeles anyway so that Celeste can make a music video. Because that's definitely a smart choice when these girls have demonstrated their level of impulse control when left unsupervised. To prove this point, the girls end up at a new club almost immediately, one that merits an epilepsy warning, and after more awkward cinematography, Celeste slips away with a guitarist, and though we are thankfully spared from actually seeing them do the deed, we are forced to endure both their awkward musical-based flirtations and Celeste's pillow talk afterward, in an existential monologue about dreams of her near-death experience and why she wants to make pop music. That's what I love about pop music. I don't want people to have to think too hard. I just want them to feel good. Sin number three goes to the film's pretentious viewpoint. The movie already tried something like this earlier, showing Celeste popping a painkiller and cranking up the Dawson's Creek theme while ignoring the newsfeed in the background. If that had been the end of it, the commentary might have escaped the sin count, but the movie keeps reiterating its position that pop music is awful and shallow and distracts from the real world, and sweet Lucifer, this is the kind of movie you hear praised by a film student who lists Fight Club as his favorite movie, but who thinks Tyler Durden was the hero of the story. This is a movie that wants to prove how smart it is by being above the kind of things the ordinary masses enjoy. Anything silly or fun or escapist is anathema, because there's so much unhappiness in the world that anything that suggests otherwise or provides happiness must either be ignorant or deliberately deceptive. And we barely have time to recover from that anvil being dropped before it's the next morning and Celeste comes into Ellie's room to find her sister in bed with their manager. And she tells them... I'm a plane crashed into a building in New York. If it weren't for the facts that I know remember me exists, this would be the most contrived way to insert the September 11th attacks into a movie ever. 
And to add insult to injury, rather than letting this revelation settle, the movie immediately cuts to Celeste's music video shoot, and the narration informs us that her lost innocence mirrors the lost innocence of America. The idea of Celeste's journey symbolizing the millennial loss of innocence through the turn of the century and beyond is a concept that is better in theory than in practice. The movie oversells it by not only having her directly involved in a Columbine-esque school shooting, but also having two crucial moments of her maturity tied to 9-11, the loss of her virginity and, implicitly, the conception of her daughter. The on-the-nose quality of it all is enough to earn sin number four, especially since this entire first act has been a poorly paced and meandering affair that isn't able to impart the intended message on the strength of its own material. And the movie seems to understand that it's overstayed its welcome, because, with the comment that the sisters' paths have now diverged, it jumps ahead to 2017 and Act 2, creatively named Regenesis. Where we get to have yet another shooting scene. This one, which happens in Croatia, is mercifully shorter and less gory than the first one, but still not worth showing. We then return to New York, where Jude Law is still playing the manager, but the 31-year-old Celeste is now being played by Natalie Portman, preparing for the launch of her new album and world tour. I'm making arrangements to hold a press conference downstairs at 4. A press conference? Yeah. Are you kidding me? And despite feeling like it's not too much purpose, Natalie Portman's performance is this movie's saving grace. Perhaps from a combination of personal experience and the documentaries of Madonna and Lady Gaga she watched as research, she's very effective as a jaded celebrity who's been kicked around by a callous, frequently sexist industry and is trying very hard not to be discarded by it. Her Celeste is a woman who both grew up too fast and never grew up at all, and she deserved more time than the movie gives her to properly explore and develop the character. Her presence is also boosting the performances of basically everyone around her, especially Jude Law, although that might be because this was their fourth movie together. The manager and Josie brief Celeste on the shooting before she catches up with Ellie and with her daughter Albertine, who's being played by young Celeste's actress, Raffi Cassidy, in an attempt to seem Brechtian and comment on the past and the future. After some cajoling, hey, Celeste mom. takes Albertine out for lunch. I hate talking to kids these days. They always say they don't know about everything. What are you, depressed or what? At this point, the script devolves into a greatest hit mix of cliches that it wants to pretend are profound. Celeste makes a comment about other stars having unflattering birthmarks and vestigial tales. She complains about branded content, video games, and commercialization. And while Portman is giving it her all in trying to sell it, this is a good time to bring up sin number five, the lack of a cohesive journey for Celeste. She leaps from all-American girl to party animal to jaded legend, but how, and more importantly, why she goes there is ignored. It's just assumed that pop music is terrible, and therefore Celeste becomes terrible. As a result, it wastes the nuance Natalie Portman puts into this role, because her characterization exists independent of everything we see over the course of the movie. If the movie had shown us the process, or better yet, told the majority of the story from the adult Celeste's perspective with her backstory filled out in flashback, it could be easier to understand how the dots connected and... What are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to measure how hard she's acting based on the angle of her eyebrows. It's a Portman hallmark. Well, stop it. <sighs> si vous en sistez. When the manager at the diner where they're trying to eat won't respect their privacy, Celeste and Albertine head out again. Over yet another back shot, the narration exposits about Celeste having been in a car accident while under the influence, which led to a major lawsuit and scandal, and that Albertine has recently lost her virginity and is planning to tell her mother in the hopes of reawakening Celeste's maternal instincts, and I've been too nice to Willem Dafoe at this point, the narration is going on the sin count. It's inconsistently used throughout the story, it often violates the cardinal filmmaking rule of show don't tell, and it's often obvious that it was just used as a patch job late in the game to make changes to the story. Celeste goes to yell at Eleanor for this oversight of guardianship, not unreasonably given the circumstances surrounding Albertine's birth, but Eleanor acts like she's the wounded party given that she's not only raising Celeste's child, but is also her songwriter, and threatens to remind the public of this. 
Since few pop stars write their own songs, and most have weathered worse scandals, Celeste laughs this off and heads off to her press conference, with brief cuts back to the Croatian shooting in a way that suggests... I'm not sure what, maybe that Celeste is more traumatized than she admits. At the conference, she initially sticks to the script given to her by Josie before going off the rails in a tirade we only hear about through the narration, followed by another speech in a smaller round table with journalists where the plug gets pulled before Celeste can get herself cancelled. But it's no secret that I'm on meds for my injury and I never should have been behind the wheel of a car that night. Given a reprieve from the duties of stardom, Celeste comes across her manager embracing her daughter, and although she's understandably pissed off about this to the point of shouting, he eventually gets her under control. By which I mean the two of them get high and have sex. Because pop music and moral decay. And the end result is the one moment of levity in the movie. Being escorted to the concert venue, Celeste, still somewhat intoxicated, makes the car stop and gets out to take a moment of reflection on the beach with Albertine before arriving at the venue and going into a full breakdown that only Eleanor can soothe. As the movie wants us to believe Eleanor is the grounded and good sister, despite enabling Celeste's misery because she's supportive or something. The movie then gets to its real selling point, the finale. The well, kind of. Celeste, now wearing silver hair paint, face jewels, and a spangled leotard, launches into a 20-minute concert sequence with flashing lights and billboards that might be meant to show subliminal messages, but the editing is so wild that it's hard to tell what those messages are. are okay. Whatever Sia's flaws, and believe me, I have seen music, I know full well what her flaws are, there is a definite dark side to songs like Chandelier and Big Girls Cry that you don't expect to find in your average dance pop. But in trying to make pop songs that fit the thesis of the film, the result is music that has the potential to be good, but ends up mostly sounding like the stuff you play for an exercise class, something to get the adrenaline flowing and motivate you to move. You can also tell that Natalie Portman learned them by ear because there's definitely some Sia pronunciation in there. But then comes the moment. The moment I knew that one day, this would be sitting in your court. She recounted a story to Eleanor that went something like this. Shortly after her classmate pulled the trigger and sent her to the place between life and death, a place that she was only able to describe to Eleanor as a rush of color. She had met the devil and made a deal with him in exchange for her life. So there are two options here. Either A, Celeste's near-death experience was a dream, albeit an oddly prophetic one, or B, it was real and she really is the boss's instrument on Earth. If it's the former, the symbolism is very on the nose even by the standards of this movie. If it's the latter... Come on, that's the best message you've got? Popular music is the work of the devil? Because that's a line that's been repeated since Elvis swiveled his hips, since Scott Joplin tickled the ivories. Here, some medieval priest probably uttered it after smacking a boy soprano for humming a body tavern tune. Either way, the literal or figurative selling of one's soul for fame and fortune has been done before and better. Besides, if you want to convince us Celeste is emblematic of the downfall of civilization, you need to give her more than a sparkly unitard and a techno beat. Now, it's not as if this wasn't foreshadowed. Between the acts being labeled Genesis and Regenesis, the serpent tattoo on the older Celeste's arm, moments when she calls herself the New Faith, her music the New New Testament, and her fans Little Angels, and the title of the movie itself properly declining in Latin to Vox Lucis, the clues are kind of obvious in retrospect. But the foreshadowing is secondary to the failures of characterization and theme. Throughout the movie, Celeste's behavior has technically been reasonable, though somewhat heightened given the context of her life, and the majority of her worst actions have been the result of others' influence over her. Adding in this infernal bargain effectively removes all possible agency she could have had. 
It brings to mind Britney Spears' conservatorship without the Free Britney movement to counter it and offer her any kind of sympathy or even the chance to support women's wrongs. Celeste gives us one more song that does allude to the twist a little before the movie focuses on the manager, Ellie, and Albertine watching the concert and then fades into color, suggesting that everyone watching might now be here as the credits roll in reverse. There are a couple of ways Fox looks could have worked better. It could have focused more on Portman's performance and allowed her to carry an otherwise flawed narrative. It could have been a condemnation of Celeste's exploitation, either as a Britney Spears-style pop idol or, in keeping with her Cassie Bernal parallels, as a poster child of evangelical Christianity. Or it could have more fully explored its implication that the obsession with popular entertainers and the sensationalism of large-scale tragedy are two sides of the same coin. Instead, it tries to do a little of all these things and ends up doing none of them very well, especially since it's working from the premise that it is the product of the music industry that's the problem and not the system. There's not enough glitz to make the gilded cage or allure of fame angle work. The tragic elements are used for shock value in a way that comes off as tasteless. It's simultaneously too aware and too oblivious of the issues that femme-identifying people in the entertainment industry face, and at times even comes off like it's victim-blaming its central character. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For the awkward, variably frenetic, and dull cinematography, director of photography Lowell Crawley is condemned to play Where's Waldo on a roller coaster while wearing beer goggles. For their hypocritical and neglectful exploitation of Celeste, the manager and Eleanor are condemned to run PR for Lydia Tarr. For the overbearing nature of his narration, Willem Dafoe is condemned to have his favorite music interrupted by amateur murder podcasts every 20 minutes. Finally, for his shallow script and failure to properly explore the issues, Brady Corbett is condemned to an eternity of the Saturday Night Live high school theater sketches. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. Well, that was interesting. So how do we get out of here? Do you still have those cards you brought in? Yeah. Why? I'll tell you the way out in exchange for a spread. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see. Five cards got me in, so five cards to get me out. And let's see. So two of wands, six of swords, judgment, death, and the world. So what I'm getting here is that you're dissatisfied. You need to think about what you want. And you want a change because of that. You need to find something new. But the only way you can do that is by owning up to your past, by atoning and facing judgment. But once you do that, death in this case is more about rebirth, transformation, the end of one story so that you can complete where you're meant to be and start a new one. So what does that all mean? Have you been talking with anybody from the far side of purgatory recently? I might have had a visit recently. Why? Just, um, maybe you don't assume that bridge was burned entirely? What bridge? There was no bridge. There was a long plummet, and then I wound up here. No bridges were involved. So maybe it's a ladder. I don't know. The cards aren't exact. You got your reading. Now how do I get out of here? Down the hall, door marked, narratively convenient exit. Can't miss it. Ah. Thanks. La, 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 la. Bailiff? Do you know if we have any ladders around? Mm -hmm.